Hello and welcome to the YouTube podcast series of Cities ABC and Open Business Council. I'm Hilton Super, the Vice Chairman of Student Group. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Robbins, quant and financial artificial intelligence expert and author of a book called The Quantitative Asset Management Factor Investing, Machine Learning for Institutional Investing. So this is where we interview people who are changing the world, people that are inspiring us with their achievements, and there have been many, and creativity and acumen, the use of technology. Now, in previous interviews, um, we've interviewed over 300 amazing people and achieved more than 15 million views. This interview series is on Cities ABCs in partnership with our platform, OpenBusinessCouncil.org, which is a Web 3.0 fourth industrial revolution-based platform, which uses technology to employ truth and trust using corporate digital identity, blockchain, and the deployment of data, an data analytics, AI, and machine learning. So welcome, Michael Robbins. Thank you. And wow, I would have tripped over those words a, a dozen times. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a good editor. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually really, really wonderful to, to speak to you because, as, you, as, as we mentioned before, quantitative asset management is part of my, my past and, and a very, very important part of my past and how it's nice to be able to speak to somebody who's had the same, you know, the same route, um, but now you're at the zenith of your power, you know, the zenith, given the fact that you now have a lot more computing power than we had in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the context is is really valuable because uh, a lot of people are seeing how wonderful these tools have become. Like ChatGPT is just shocking and amazing people. But if you understand the evolution, if you've been involved in it for a while, it, it's really not something completely new. It, it's just, in fact, a little less impressive than some of the other tools that we've been using. Exactly. So where are you at this present time? Talk a little bit about where you where you are and we can talk a little about um, you know, your history. Yeah, yeah. My history and how my career has uh, grown through time uh, is part of the reason why I wrote the book, uh, because when I originally started working on Wall Street, uh, I just knew my few feet of the desk and the people that were around me. And uh, as I advanced in my career as I became a, a C-level officer and and saw banks and, and other institutions and, and investment advisors, there was a whole world that I knew nothing about. And I thought I knew everything because I was a professional investor, you know, in, in a Wall Street bank. Uh, so that that's kind of some of the information uh, that I'd like, I'd like to talk about in the book. Um, but right now, my career has evolved into this kind of octopus where I'm um, teaching uh, at a university. Uh, I contract and, and I have chief investment officer roles at, at banks and hedge funds and private equity firms. Uh, and I'm writing books and I'm doing all sorts of things. And uh, it's very complicated to explain to people. But uh, up until recently, it's been pretty straightforward. I was just investing money using computers and using uh, processes rather than uh, intuition, which is what a lot of people rely on. Exactly. But you started as a, um, you know, um, you didn't start in finance. You started as a nuclear physicist. You'll remember, but many of your viewers won't. Uh, computers have been around a very long time, but they haven't been useful to Wall Street trading desks uh, until maybe, what, 30 years ago. Uh, before then, there were these giant things that were used for accounting and, you know, took up whole rooms. And when they became the size of modern computers, Wall Street took notice and knew there was tremendous opportunity there, but there was nobody trained to use them, really, not, not in that context. And mm -hmm. my pet theory is that they hired nuclear physicists to do it because it sounded really cool. Right? They hired uh, professional sports players as salesmen because that sounded interesting, right? and people wanted to meet them and have dinner with them. And they probably hired... Uh, nuclear engineers and nuclear physicists, because that sounded interesting, even though probably a high school math teacher could have done it. Uh, but as a result, a lot of the math that we use on Wall Street now came from physics, like Monte Carlo analysis and the Black-Scholes equation have direct analogs to physics equations. And it's not a coincidence. It's because they hired those people to figure this stuff out. And even some of the top hedge funds now still hire physicists to do their more creative quant work. And mm -hmm. it 
it's it's a bit uh unfortunate i think that a lot of people go to school for financial engineering and and to do these things and then the the hedge funds hire physicists anyway even though they don't have you know the direct education in those specific things because they understand the background the context and you know the the underpinnings of the equations and are able to see their flaws and and modify them uh with i think a better understanding than people who learn just how to use them uh yeah, as they're used currently. I mean, there's a, there's a danger in the financial industry is if you hire people from in the Wall Street industry, if you hire them from the the, the different universities, they're all being spoon fed to the same view of the world and use the mm-hmm. same processes, the same models, and things like that. So you're not really buying anything that you can 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 usefully use because they just the same old same old, even though it's leading yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. And we saw that during the great financial crisis when people were using correlation models. They're all based on geographic diversification. And I'm sure all the traders understood that well. They call themselves correlation traders for a reason. Mm -hmm. But if you had gone to school and learned the models and just started working without understanding the context, then maybe you wouldn't have understood that exposure. And uh, even though people didn't generally hedge against it, you wouldn't have known to even if you wanted to. So tell me a little bit about your experience on Wall Street in the early days. Did they, you know, you know, you know, did they put the quants and you know next door to the the back office or down in the basement? Oh, that was. There were so many tremendous benefits uh, to my first job. Uh, one of them was which I was hired as a proprietary trader, which is basically a portfolio manager in the context that I was in, uh, not as a quant. They didn't even know really what a quant was. They just mm-hmm. said, we, we're doing this arbitrage. It involves equations and things. And, you know, we should hire somebody who knows how to do that stuff. And so I was trading real money right away. I mean, huge books of money because it was really highly leveraged. Uh, and um, I eventually ended up hiring quants to help me, but I wasn't specifically a quant. I was an investor, which was fantastic. And another thing that was really fantastic about it that came out of their Wall Street's general lack of understanding is that they didn't give me a mandate. So I was able to trade anything. They just said, oh, you're you're the guy who uses numbers. You know, if, if you can think of something that uses numbers, go for it. So I, I traded everything in my first 15 years. I, I traded credit and foreign exchange and bonds and stocks. It, I wasn't restricted. And that was the launching point for my career as a chief investment officer because I had an in-depth knowledge of so many different things, uh, which is unusual on Wall Street, I think. People are specialists on Wall Street. They know everything there is to know about a tiny sliver of markets. Uh, And I got a a pretty interesting experience because nobody really knew what to do with me at the beginning. And then after I was working with them a couple of years, you know, it was too onerous for them to change my my goal. Um, So yeah, I wasn't specifically a quant, and uh, but I do train quants. And I a lot of them are just so introverted or don't have really good communication skills. They kind of get in their own way. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to say I was privileged that I was uh, I was born in this country. And so as a Kwan who is a native English speaker, I would have a lot of opportunities that were open to me that weren't open to the plethora of foreigners who were much better educated than I was, uh, but yet couldn't really communicate as well. And because the managers were in quants, they needed good communication because they didn't understand what I was doing and they needed reassurance and they needed things to be put in a common language. And if I had a very thick accent, you know, back then it was Russian or Indian. Now Chinese is, is very common. Um, the managers aren't comfortable with you taking risk. Uh, and so that was another benefit that I didn't deserve, but I took advantage of as much as I could. So can you tell us a little bit about the the transition that you you made from you know academic um, nuclear physicist, proprietary trading, and yeah, then it was AIO. Sorry to, to step on your words. Uh, yeah, it, w- it was interesting and it was fun, and it's relevant that uh, in between 
being a physicist and working on Wall Street, I, I did some work in electronic warfare. And you can see the parallels between that and algorithmic trading, right? where you try to create systems that are too fast for people to use that have to fight each other right and have to spoof each other and and you know um it was the same thing with radar you know in the 80s and 90s and um so so that was helpful um what was difficult was that wall street hadn't really caught up to what we were doing in physics even long before my time so uh you may remember uh, the common way to solve uh equations like the Black-Scholes equation was to use like binary trees, even trinary trees. Uh, but in school, we learned a different method. We used uh, the Crank-Nicholson method, you know, and it was much more sophisticated and accurate and, and good, but nobody was using it. And I told my boss, oh, we should be using this thing that I learned in school, you know, a few years ago. He said, oh, no, no, people don't do it that way. And then, of course, uh, you know, a few years later, uh, Wilmot came out with books that talked about it said look look this is what i told you we should do i, said, I don't remember that you know i don't remember you telling me you know so um it, it was uh it was an interesting thing uh where i actually knew a little more than some other people just because i had different exposure but i wasn't senior enough to have the confidence and the uh, uh the fortitude to push my my better solutions on other people but they gave me a lot of leeway and it was great exploring and finding things out and everybody else was doing it too, which was fun. Also, uh, there were all these, uh, blogs and bulletin boards. I don't think there were blogs back then, but there were, were messaging systems and, uh, chat rooms like, uh, nuclear finance with a PHY, uh, and you know they're just people trying to figure stuff out. It was it was a really interesting time, kind of like what crypto is like now, uh, except we didn't have the model to follow. Now crypto is not really following the traditional finance model, but they could because they seem to be coming up with the same solutions in a more painful way. Uh, that back then we were figuring things out, you know, from scratch using physics as a model. But mm -hmm. it, it was a great time, and it allowed me a lot of. Um, independence right because the people around me didn't understand what i was doing so i was free to try to invent my own solutions and um yeah that's not true in traditional finance you know they they kind of sit you next to a, a seasoned person and even if he doesn't teach you he you know, slaps you on the head if you do something wrong or he fires you but here i could just go off on a tangent and nobody had any idea what i was doing uh, I mean and um yeah, but since you had so much, or I say no autonomy or, or independence. You know, there's lots of sort of like you know you must have learned the hard way the sort of the rules of the game when you run and build quantitative models, is that you you know you you build the model with one sample of data and then you run it out of sample to make sure it actually works. And this time you actually include transaction costs because I've seen so many times. <laughs> fantastic results that don't even follow those uh those principles yeah yeah it's um yeah complication was a real problem back then because the mm -hmm. computers were so much slower we used to run our analyses overnight and if the computer crashed overnight we wouldn't have the, the data to trade during the day we just have to wing it on the the previous day's data um yeah so but it, it actually really helps out now uh, so a lot of, you know, I train students a lot and they know, you know, the modern technology and then I give them a large data set and they're stuck. It doesn't load into pandas. It doesn't load into Excel. They don't know what to do. And I said, well, just use the old Unix tools, right? They were created 40 years ago. And even though they were created to run quickly on small data sets, they're a great way to handle large data sets because we have the same problems now as we had back then. But now it's with the big data sets, right? And, and so if you use, you know, you know, Gawk or um, you know any of the other Unix tools, um, Grep, uh, things like that, it, they work great, right? And they're fast. And you know, the students they don't know them because nobody's used them for thirty years, except the people who used them thirty years ago. Uh, so it's really great like that. And uh, another huge advantage of figuring things out for yourself um, is you get that 
that fire in your belly, right? Like when you teach people how it's done, it's drudgery, right? You have to learn all these things of how people did it. But if you're trying to do it yourself and you're struggling with C++ and somebody says, oh, you know, look, there's this language that'll do all this memory management and stuff for you. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Your eyes light up. It's like, well, now I can get, you know, five hours back a day, you know, just from being able to use this tool. It doesn't matter that it, it's horribly boring to anyone else. To you, it means you get hours back in your life and you don't have to struggle with compiling right so um so that that energy was a big part of advancing my career and solving things uh just the the benefit of figuring out ways to make my life better or to make money right that's another thing that all traders know it's the most boring esoteric niche market is fascinating if it can make you a million dollars today and yeah, you, know, you want to know everything there is about it. It's super interesting. Exactly. I mean, I mean, as I was trying to get to, is that with quantitative models, you have to apply it in the real, the real world. And then we talked a little bit about okay, assuming what the you know making a model work based on real transaction costs, liquidity, gates, locked up, lockups, even settlement periods, T plus settlement periods. So, I mean, give us a little bit of examples of the ch these sort of challenges that you've you've had in the past and how important they are today. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. It's uh, computers are still not fast enough. At least the computers people, most people have access to, are not fast enough to do even, excuse me, the basic things that we want to do. Uh, you mentioned uh, gates and lockups. That, that's a huge problem because uh, it, it's path dependent. Right. So you can't just run independent periods or even periods uh, that are in uh, successive, uh, but you have to trace your whole path. And that that's really hard for a computer program to do. It really slows it down. Or if you want to do something like robust optimization, which has been around a long time, it involves many, many trials of something that is not very fast to begin with. Right. Mm -hmm. And so these very basic things that people wanted to do 20 years ago are still not possible without cutting corners mm -hmm. and understanding what things to choose and what to leave out is really where the experience and the art comes in. And it's, it's not easy because you want to do everything, right? Even doing everything is very theoretical and can cause you a lot of problems. Uh, but not doing everything is, is even worse and we always have to make these choices. And, and that's a big part of quant trading too, that I'm sure you understand, but a lot of viewers might not, is that when you create any sort of algorithm, you're making hundreds or thousands of discretionary choices for no good reason, just because they have to be made, right? If uh, one of the examples I bring up a lot, uh, an example of uh, specification error, which is one of the biggest problems I've seen with any quant uh, is just answering the right question, right? Asking the right question. And it's not as easy as it sounds. A lot of people start out saying, oh, well, I want to make an algorithm that makes money. Well, yeah, how do you define making money? Is that rolling yearly returns? Is it monthly returns? Do you include a stop out? Do you include uh, you know, three barriers? Uh, you know, there's lots of different ways to define it. None of them are perfect, but the simplest are completely unrealistic, right? If you define it as, say, uh, a period return, a terminal return, well, if you make $10 million on a $1,000 trade, you're going to take profits, right? You're not going to wait to the end of the period. And the same thing is true with losses. Right? Very few people have the luxury of just riding their losses till they come back. So mm -hmm. all these questions are really complicated to model. You can't model them all perfectly, and it's hard to even think of how to model them well, especially with those constraints. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of things, and that's kind of what I tried to address in the book. The way I really got the idea for the book, like everyone else in quant finance, I just Google a lot of things when I don't know something. First, I try to figure out if somebody else has figured it out. It's really difficult to find 
blogs or even research papers that address even the most simple complexities, like you mentioned transaction costs, right? Up until a few years ago, most research papers didn't even include transaction costs, much less, you know, realistic ones with market impact and, you know, things like that. And I said, well, like, how's anybody going to learn anything if nobody writes a book about this? Like, I know the hedge funds all do it right, but they're not telling anyone because they're making money and they don't want to you know, help anybody out. So I thought there's a you know, really good opportunity to write a book that at least even in this very thick book, hundreds and hundreds of pages, I only scratched the surface of most of these things. And what I try to do, and I hope I don't frustrate readers with it, is that I try to give everybody an idea of what they need to learn. Mm -hmm. And I know as a reader, you might be uh, frustrated with the idea that, oh, he's telling us all these great things, but he's not really explaining in detail how to do it because it's impossible, right? Like I used to trade uh, the treasury basis and uh, Galen Burkhart wrote a book, the treasury bond basis, all about one tiny little niche trade. He just filled an entire book and that book is dense. It's full of really complicated stuff. And that's just one trade, right? So I, I could have written, you know, the encyclopedia Galactica about, you know, mm -hmm. all the things I talk about in the book. But what I tried to do was explain all these things that people might not know for people to say, oh, I thought I knew everything about this thing, but there's so many things I don't know. I can do all this research and become better. Mm -hmm. right? And so one particularly dense chapter is on markets, on different kinds of markets. Because if you look at blogs and research papers, they mostly talk about single name stocks or, you know, maybe some over the counter options. Uh, but there, as you know, it, almost an infinite number of products that you can trade, right? Um, all sorts of crazy little niche things. And when everybody's looking at Apple, it's a good idea to look at, you know, some sort of, you know, very esoteric thing. There's fewer people competing with you. And so I try to open up people's eyes to all the different complications and things that they can do to make themselves better, because there's just a million blogs on how to optimize single name stocks or write a back test for a pairs trade in two indices, right? I mean, one of the challenges are is that, you know, because of computing power, you know, everybody in the early days and you and I were we're you know part of that is that we're looking at the normal distribution and then that number was the start distilled down to because of computing power to the square root of it which went from variance to standard deviation because it was much easier to deal with in 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 in, in the optimization process you know with you know these are the sort of practical realities that one has to go through but we were stuck with that normal distribution for so long. But you and I know the world, particularly in finance, because of the incentivization of people in the capital markets, is not normal. Yeah, and that, that's a great uh, point because uh, that that comes into so many things with AI. There's so many ways to improve that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for instance, for Monte Carlo simulations. In the ancient days, we used Cholesky decomposition, which basically created normal distributions for each asset in the portfolio that retained their covariance structure, right? So uh, when IBM was simulated as going up, then Dell was also simulated as going up, right? And then we moved on to copulas and then non-normal copulas and non-parametric uh uh, marginal distributions. But now we have things like GANs that we can train that can do things even more accurately, hopefully, you know, with some possibility of hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing's true with optimizations with you mentioned, right? The um, the optimization that, that Markowitz uh, was famous for uh, and William Sharp, uh, now people are thinking of all sorts of AI methods of doing the same thing but mm -hmm. isn't limited to that simple method that was designed to be useful for computers back then, right? It's very 
it's not computationally intensive to do the original optimization. Uh, then people added things like using CVAR as a risk measure. And then yeah. there was uh, you know, robust optimization. There's all these improvements that were made over time, uh, which are still very limited. And now people are saying, well, we don't even have to stay in that framework of optimization. We can you know, use all sorts of other methods to accomplish mm -hmm. the same goal. And uh, the, the improvement in computing power combined with the democratization of these tools like MATLAB and Python and R, uh, and you know, it's just really opened things up to experimentation and innovation. Uh, whereas before, we were just trying to make the thing work. It was just hard enough just to get it to run. And now we have just all these tools and kind of this blue ocean to explore things and figure out better ways of doing it. So it's a really a golden time for people. Absolutely. I mean, talking about the golden time, there's lots of, you know, there's an incredible amount of knowledge if, if you know where to access it and papers, et cetera, et cetera. There's the technologies to help. You talk about Python, you talk about MATLAB, but those are sort of the core, the core uh, technologies that most people use. Um, is there anything else that you you aware of that people use within the computation and the framing of quantitative models? Yeah, well, it's a spectrum, right? Depending on people's needs and skills and uh, resources, right? So obviously the high frequency guys use very fast languages, uh, even you know, things that are co-located with specialized uh, um, languages. There's uh, a lot of people ex experimenting with supercomputers and, and quantum computers. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, we have some projects my students are working on like that. And, um, you know, it, it's evolving. And I think um, it is going to quickly become out of reach for the common person again. It was, there are huge barriers to entry to doing this kind of trading, even less sophisticated trading up until recently. And I think those barriers are going to return. So I think we have a window and people should take advantage of while they can. The people who are successful at this time can hopefully get hired by banks and hedge funds that push these things out of their reach and give them those tools. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in, in a few years time, uh, people won't be able to create competitive uh, quantitative or algorithmic trades. Mm -hmm. um, there may still be a, an ability to create a lower frequency trade and compete because there's a limit to how much technology can help when you're doing a trade that takes five months or 10 years to come to fruition. Right. Um, but most people don't have that much patience anyway, yes. and they're not interested in that sort of thing. Oh, well, and something, I think I read something um, previously that you had been talking about is that, you know, as you mentioned before, a lot of people are looking at the, you know, the, the apples and things like that, you know, big stocks. Um, but sometimes you know, you look at the smaller stocks or the smaller assets, and you, that are not traded as frequently. Frequently, but there's a little there, 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 there is an arbitrage there. There is a way to make money there. And the big institutions, their cost of risk capital is so high, and their costs are so high that they don't even look at those small transactions because it's not worth it. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and that's another thing that I think might go away as the computers are able to do that uh, without people, then they can explore all those tiny niches. But right now, uh, there's still plenty of opportunities. And those opportunities are also still available in uh, some of the larger trades too. Uh, so in the book, I talk about uh, VXX and uh, Bitcoin Trust, right? And there were huge structural problems with those products that were obvious to people who understood them, but yet many, many people got caught by those trades and lost tons and tons of money. And mm -hmm. just understanding the mechanisms, diving a little deeper than doing a regression can be really helpful to, at the very least, avoiding bad trades. Some of those trades were hard to take advantage of. Um, for instance, with VXX, you could lose a lot of money being long or short VXX. Right, the the trade was to not hold it overnight, right? Exactly. <laughs> during the day, right? But it was important to understand that 
and you know at least it could have kept you out of trouble uh, with the the arbitrage between Bitcoin and the Bitcoin trust. That one was pretty obvious to me. Uh, a lot of people, I don't know if they missed it or it, it just they were trying to pick up the money before it went away or or what happened. Uh, but the convenience yield on that just seemed like an obvious trade. So even in some of the big stuff, if you're more thoughtful about it and you think about the structures and the, the mechanistic arbitrages, the deterministic trades that aren't based on statistics, uh, there's still lots of opportunities in that. Uh, I've read some really interesting things about why there's uh, opportunities and really common things like indices. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that there's a lot of different people involved in buying and selling indices, and they all have different goals and timeframes. So there's inefficiency built into it, right? Something like the uh, the AT1s or Credit Suisse, you don't have a lot of diverse interests in it, but you do have a lot of dumb money who are buying it for a particular reason without thinking about it so much. Right? So a lot of people are caught because they didn't read the documents or they just didn't believe the documents and didn't realize that what happened when UBS acquired Credit Suisse could happen to the AT1s. Right? So there's a lot of that going on as well. So there are lots of things to take advantage of if you just think about them a little bit. But if you're a teenager writing a blog using Python and doing a you know pairs trade on you know IBM versus Apple, um, you know then maybe you're not thinking that deeply about these things. I mean, there's two ways in terms of quant. You've got the trader quant, which is looking at a particular transaction and it's a repetitive process um, in that particular asset, or they look at it as a asset manager, which is a portfolio, which requires you know, the selection, the hedging, the risk management, and all those sort of things, as much as a, you know, a, a normal trading strategy. They tend to be very similar, but very, very different. Yeah, I think the big difference uh, is in in the mindset of the trader, not in the tools or, or how they do the analysis. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whenever I meet someone who's a real trader, the first thing they ask is, you know, what's your edge? What's your particular advantage over the market? And most people have no advantage whatsoever, and, and yet they go in ahead first. Uh, when I started trading, uh, a guy I used to work with, uh, he wasn't really well educated. I don't remember you know, if he even graduated high school. He was a very successful trader, and uh, he was very aggressive. And he got started uh, in what they called the cage. In the banks, uh, a lot of bonds were actual pieces of paper, right? They weren't electronically traded. And it was his job to, to count the pieces of paper in the cage. Each piece might have been worth a lot of money. It was a bond, right? But he was he was supposed to count them. And he, uh, he told me the story. I think it's just an anecdote that he heard. But what he told me was uh, it was more accurate to weigh a stack of papers and figure out how much a pound, how many papers would make up a pound, than it was to count them because you invariably made mistakes counting them. So he told me, you know, he would come in in the morning, he'd weigh the stack of papers, he'd be done in a half an hour, and it was a day's worth of work. And you know, then he'd go off and you know go drink at the local bar or whatever people did back then, right? And you know, it's kind of that ingenuity and that drive to make money, those sharp elbows. Um, mm -hmm which I think really differentiates what a lot of people who call themselves quants are and people who really make money do, right? They're constantly angling and aggressive and you know, looking for opportunities as small as they can be uh, just to do anything they can to make money. And it doesn't matter if that involves buying the dry cleaner on the corner or writing some esoteric research paper, you know, it's, it's all about how much money they can make as quickly as possible and get out before they lose it. It's very interesting how, um, you know, um, the industry has evolved. Um, you know, we, we, we started, you know, with quantitative models to look at, and you know, we talked about black shawls, we talked about um, farm and French, we talked about, uh, global tactical asset allocation, you mentioned pre uh, briefly. We, we talk about uh, Sharp, we talk about uh, 
you know, all these academics that came up with great, great models, they were applied, they've been used, they continue being used, they're now being rediscovered in different different formats, et cetera. And then we have the, the concept of what is called hedge funds. So you and I know hedge funds is like you're hedging out something. So if you're going to go along the market of, uh, and you can short stocks and you can arbitrage that, or you have good stocks on one side and short stocks on bad stocks on the other, and you, you, know, you make sure that you are neutral to the market. That's sort of the concept of hedge funds. And then, of course, you have global macro, event-driven, and all these different types of strategies that you know, the hedge fund managers started using. But today, anything that is considered alternative is a hedge fund. So how do you unpack Yeah, that? Yeah, hedge funds are, are a legal structure. They don't most of them don't even really hedge, right? There are lots of long only hedge funds that just invest in stocks. And a lot of them aren't even very sophisticated. Uh, I think hedge fund is, is a misnomer. If you're talking about hedging, I'd call it an arbitrage, right? Those are arbitrageurs, right? Yeah. Um, and the hedge fund structure is, uh, it's just a legal entity that now that we have private equity funds, venture capital funds, we have all sorts of different ways to invest that are tax advantaged uh, or less so than before. Uh, I think the defining feature of any of these things, hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, uh, to some extent is uh, that they're traditionally made up of people who learned how to do what they do either on their own or in a bank, and then wanted to go off and run their own company. Right Now there are some firms that are absolutely Behemoths, right? Uh, some of these hedge funds have tens of billions of dollars, and you have these giant private equity firms. But I think in uh, the ethos of Wall Street, right, you become a successful trader and you say, All right, I want to go off on my own and not have to answer to a boss and worry about rolling layoffs at the bank or whatever, you know, HR nonsense, you know, I have to deal with today. Uh, and I, I just want to do it on my own from the beach or in my plane or wherever I am. Right? Uh, it, it's not really the way it plays out a lot of the time, but that's that's really how people think about it, I think. And mm -hmm. it, it's really attractive uh, for that reason. Uh, and then on the flip side, uh, the allocators have uh, a negative aspect to that, where it, the the canonical, the uh, you know, the typical stereotypical way of thinking about it is you have some this huge ego cowboy guy doing whatever he wants, his own firm, you know, doing things that would get him arrested if he did him at a bank, you know, like uh, sexual harassment or whatever stuff these people get caught. At. Uh, and you know they they need to be very carefully managed, but they're opaque. They'll only tell you what their performance is on a monthly basis. Uh, if they file regulatory filings, you only know you know what they owned at the moment of filing, and you know, they may have done some window dressing and sold off the you know the scary things and then filed and then bought them back, or or maybe they don't report some things like some options, and you only know half of the portfolio, and you know, but they can make tons of money and you can't afford not to invest in them uh you know so you have to you know clamor and 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 try to get you know allowed to give them your money right and, and this is kind of uh a really fun way to talk about it i don't think it's the way it really works very much anymore which leads us into the the evolution of the industry and in particular the tools that you have today we've we've now got even just data. We have access to a lot more data outside the data that sits within the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange. There's factors that you can pick up on. And it's data which is public available that you can have these amazing data sets that you can, with natural language, you know, with, with NLP, you can actually pull out very, you can sense, you get sentiment from these and you can apply sentiment to those factors, to these models, which are algorithms, which are based on machine learning or um, you know, AI, um, uh, uh, um, AI and, and, gener and then gener generative models within that particular space, all because we have access to very, very powerful computing. 
So it talks a little bit about, about how we've evolved and what the, the opportunities and the risks are of what we have today in terms of data, technology, and processes. Yeah, you, you mentioned a bunch of really interesting things in that question. Sorry. Lots and lots of really interesting things. Um, I'll try to talk about all of them. Uh, so yeah, data is king, right? Data is really important. And why it's important now more than before is uh, because now we have tools that can look at a lot of data. And even now, these tools are not good enough to look at a lot of data. Uh, so there's opportunities. Uh, like we were talking about earlier, uh, in a few years, the tools will be so good that that data inefficiency will be arbitraged away. But right now, uh, I think it's still there. And um, the data is expensive. Uh, so it's there is a lot of publicly available data, but a lot of this alternative data that people call it um, is expensive and hard to get. Uh, incidentally, uh, the way a lot of people talk about uh, alternative data is that it's just weird in some way. It doesn't fit in a table. Uh, it's uh, oddly structured, things like that. Uh, going back to my, my defense days, we were dealing with alternative data forever, right? Like AI, it's not a new thing. I remember when I, I was working in defense, we uh, wrapped the wires in our computers in, in tinfoil and grounded them. And we ran music through the windows. And the reason why is uh, somebody outside the building with sensitive equipment could look at the electromagnetic radiation from the wires and maybe decompose what I was looking on the screen. And by recording the keys, the sound of the keys on my keyboard and doing a statistical analysis, they could figure out what letters I was typing in what I was typing so they could it would be like they had a camera over my shoulder and that was alternative data in the 80s right and then it grew to say like satellite photographs one of the really common examples of alternative data uh, during the 90s was if you look at a satellite photograph of um, tanks that people stored grain in the tanks would grow as they were more full and their shadows would elongate so you could tell from satellite photograph of the shadow of a tank uh, how full it was or how many cars were in a parking lot of a store to tell whether that store was getting a lot of business. Right? And that was really hard data to analyze way back when. Now computers you know, can do it very easily you know, just using algorithms. So uh, it's become tractable to analyze that data. Uh, the data is available. You can buy satellite data uh, as an individual. Um, there are some data sets that are hard to find. Oh, and I remember the uh, even Bloomberg has a screen where they show you where all the oil tankers are in the world. And you could tell if they're parked offshore because they're waiting for the price of oil to change to make it more uh, uh, profitable to sell their oil or whether they should just store it in the tankers just sitting in the ocean, which is kind of a fun trade. So um, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of great, really interesting data. Uh, people probably haven't figured out all the ways to use them. Computers are not powerful enough to look at them all simultaneously right now, uh, but they will be. Uh, I remember uh, I learned after the attack on uh, the Trade Center in September 11th, uh, the government uh, the intelligence community had ways of combining all of uh, a person's social media, their different email addresses, their text messages, their blog posts. They had software that could uh, out uh, combine all those things so that when they were trying to find out if someone was a terrorist, they could see all their linked accounts. I mean, I wish my iPhone did that now, you know, so many years later. But uh, really well-resourced companies like banks and big hedge funds can certainly do things like that now if they want to. Uh, and uh, they can do things like analyze Twitter feeds, uh, do a kind of alpha capture where they could figure out which posters are good at predicting and then follow them with a higher weight than maybe some other posters. Um, but I think it's, it's a really hard problem to solve. I was just thinking about this the other day. I, I was looking at 
uh, an online newspaper that I thought was uh, reasonably reputable, uh, certainly not Pulitzer worthy, but uh, their their stories were just so laden with uh, emotionally charged words and so obviously biased towards getting clicks that you know this sentiment analysis that you were talking about sounds great in theory, right? But I don't know. There's so much misdirection and uh, what do they call it? Uh, dark, um, dark patterns, right? In in yep. media, yep. that I don't know. These algorithms have to be pretty sophisticated to understand the subtext, which a lot of people don't even understand. And um, I still think there's quite a bit of work to do with it. And mm -hmm. there's also a lot of really interesting things that aren't so hard. There's people aren't generally that smart or they just don't think that much about what they're doing. And so things like looking at sentence complexity, right? Or the number of syllables in the, in the words that a person uses can kind of betray their intent. So mm -hmm. if you look at uh, CEO announcements, right? And them talking about their company, if they're using a lot of complex language or a lot of multi-syllabic words and maybe they're trying to cover something up, maybe they're trying to be a little dishonest. Uh, whereas yeah. if, you know, they're speaking plainly, maybe what they're saying is more reliable. Uh, I think there's still a lot of simple analysis that people can use uh, in order to uncover some opportunities, especially in mass. Right. Um, I remember an anecdote that uh, Cliff Asnes told, and I don't know if if this is truly his anecdote or if he heard it somewhere. I don't remember specifically, but he, he talks about how he's walking down the hallway of his his hedge fund AQR, and he passes by one of his more qualitative portfolio managers who's really excited about this trade and really wants to overweight this position, and he wants uh, Doctor Asnes's input. You know, what do you think about the stock? And uh, he says, you know, I don't even know, you know, I trade in so many positions. I don't even know if I'm long or short it. I might be short it even if I like it because of the correlations with my other positions. You know, I, I don't really have an opinion. Right. And and that's kind of the advantage of doing these analyses is that if you do enough trades and you're right, in theory, it, the noise will kind of be filtered out. And you, you mentioned factors. Well, that, that's exactly the reason why we use factors. Mm -hmm. If we look at complex things like indices or even individual assets like a bond, they're so full of noise and complicating features that they can easily befuddle an algorithm. They, they befuddle people too, but certainly an algorithm, which is very sensitive to outliers and other things that may confuse it. And so in the simple case of a sovereign bond, you have so many other things besides interest rates. So interest rates may be one factor. You may have the uh, the shape of the yield curve, which is simply just the difference in yield between a longer maturity and a shorter maturity, the, the term premium. Right? You don't even have to worry about credit risk. But you might have, uh, for instance, uh, supply and demand issues. On the supply side, some of these bonds might have been stripped. There just might not be a lot of them out there to buy in, in their um, packaged format. Uh, the demand may be high. You may want to hedge a mortgage bond, and you might want a treasury to match the maturity. So some maturities may be very popular, whereas others might not. It, all these elements of noise will confuse an algorithm if they're not stripped out and looked at in isolation. So for instance, uh, with the bond example, what you want to do is you want to kind of bootstrap the cash flows to separate them out. Then you want to do um, a biased analysis using something uh, like a yield curve fitting algorithm, like a Svensson model, in order to find a pure uh, term structure. A, you know, mm -hmm. a per, pure term premium, then you want to strip out the interest rates, forecast those interest rates and that term structure, and then rebuild the bonds with all those complexities in them, and then compare that value to the actual bond that's trading to decide whether it's rich or cheap. And even then, 
you want to do something like use a Z-score because something can be perpetually rich or cheap and, and never clean up. And that's just one of the simplest investments you could possibly make uh, a sovereign treasury bond. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why we use factors to simplify the problem into pure features, because that's just hard enough to mm -hmm. predict. Even that's nearly impossible to predict. To try to predict something without simplifying it into factors is, is just a problem that I don't think is tractable. Exactly. And factors aren't persistent. Yeah, it, everything is time varying. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a huge problem with any method, especially statistics and even now AI, is that most of these problems are simplified to the point where they're not useful even for normal time series, even time series with independent observations. When you add in the complexity of forecasting time series, you narrow your tools down to a much smaller subset. And then mm -hmm. when you talk about financial time series, which are just full of these violations, uh, they're they're multicollinear, they're you know all skewed, they're um, they have all sorts of problems associated with them that almost no algorithms can truly solve. Then. Mm -hmm. We reach problems which you were talking about earlier in this interview about overfitting or underfitting, high bias models, high variance models. It's just so many assumptions you have to make just to get the thing to work, mm -hmm. much less to get it work consistently and persistently and reliably. Uh, it, it still requires a tremendous amount of art. And uh, one of the really interesting things people are doing with these models is these using these meta models, right? These models that govern models. And so you have models that work in specific regimes or specific instances. And then you have another model on top of that, deciding which models to use and when and how much to weight them. And those are things like uh, regime shifting models, where they say, oh, well, we think interest rates are going up. We think the market is going down. In that circumstance of rising interest rates and falling markets, this particular model is more reliable than this other model. So we're going to shift our investments towards that mm -hmm. one. Right? But of course, even those factors that the meta model is using, what stage of the business cycle we're in, whether interest rates are going to continue to go up, things like that are very complex problems to forecast in themselves. Exactly. I mean, short-term predictions is very are very, very difficult to get right. I mean, I remember the early days when chaos theory was all the rage, and we had to make sense of that. We used the, the K nearest neighbor um, uh, uh, approach to, to determining what, you know, where to go. Um, it's good to see that it's still being used, but in a in a slightly different form. But it's one of those things in the toolbox which one can use, and it's not new. It's been around for a very long time. Yeah, that that's absolutely right. It if you understand the basics of how these models work, obviously the implementation is very complex. Mm -hmm. But the basic idea of something like a K nearest neighbor neighbors model or a, a support vector machine is incredibly simple and naive. It's very powerful. People are ingenious and have figured out how to use these very simple concepts to solve mm -hmm. some amazingly difficult problems, but they're easy to trick. And it's important to understand how they work. Uh, I skipped over that whole business in my book because there's so many books that explain it so well. Uh, but uh, understanding how these models work so you don't trip yourself up is, is very important. Uh, and included in that is creating these factors and also the factor transformations, the way to clean them up, because some very simple things can befuddle a model. Uh, things like having different factors with different ranges. If you have one factor that goes from negative one to one and another factor that goes from 10,000 to negative 10,000, some models will overweight the second factor just because it's larger. So you have to normalize it and make them all the same range. It's as simple as dividing by 10,000. But if you don't do that, your model may be completely wrong. Uh, and so those are some of the tricks you need to learn how to do. And incidentally is most of the time that people spend as data scientists is working with their data, cleaning up their data, putting in the right format so that the model can consume it. 
And using the actual model, using scikit-learn or whatever you know model you're using is a minuscule part of the process. And that's what yeah. everybody focuses on and everybody seems to care about. That That's not how people should focus their time. They should focus on getting the data, cleaning it up and putting it in the right format. That's almost all of the effort. Absolutely. And as we move forward into the AI era, whether it's supervised learning or unsupervised learning, and then a, a developing quant models and strategies on the back of that, um, it could be incredibly dangerous because it can lose you a lot of money. Well, alternatively, you make you a lot of money, but we don't know. The predicted predictivity of it is not deterministic. Um, so give us a little bit about you know the challenges that you see now with all the you know the computing power, the data sets, and also the fact that we're now using artificial intelligence um, to potentially drive our decision-making process or the decision-making process in, 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 in asset decisions. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of really interesting concepts there. As the algorithms get more powerful, I think it's a losing battle to try to rein them in because they'll just be so much more useful than the dangers, the problems they cause are uh, imminent. Right. So people will overlook some really true and big dangers because of the value in those things, much the way that uh, people use all these online services and these free email services, even though uh, the data privacy is potentially a huge problem. They're just so convenient and useful. You can't really live in modern society without them. People say, oh, well, I'll just ignore the dangers and use them. I think the same thing will happen to a large extent. Uh, the the Places where that might not happen uh, might be with client data in banks, uh, medical data uh, are historically very sensitive to privacy. Um, uh, also, um, like clinical trials. Uh, so, um, you know, if, if you do say uh, make a machine that produces a blood test and you don't know how it works and the blood test tells you what kind of disease you have, the FDA is gonna have a difficult problem uh, authorizing that test because what if it's wrong? We have no idea how it's coming up with the answer. Uh, you know, Those sorts of things may re remain sticking points, uh, but the vast majority of other things are I think just gonna plow ahead, uh, blind to the dangers. Uh, people are talking a lot about explainability and interpretability and fairness in things like credit scores and hiring practices. Uh, but I'm not a futurist, but I, I think it's it's hard for me to believe that people are going to stop using those tools just because they create problems. Um, I found even recently um, that there are ways to get around that now. Uh, I don't know if they'll, they'll exist in the future. So for instance, uh, with ChatGPT, um, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Mario Prado, uh, taught me this uh, recently. Um, it, you can spoon feed ChatGPT data, right? You can run your own analysis and say, do your analysis, restricting your analysis completely to the data I give you, and then just use the tools you have to make it easier to understand or to simplify a vast amount of data uh, into a, a digestible amount. But that's not how people typically use it, right? That's what people who read things like my book understand. That's the kind of things that I emphasize. But people on blogs and, and videos and things, they talk about, oh, well, just type a question into ChatGPT and have it search the cesspool of the internet to find an answer. And uh, of course, you know, that's going to come up with an incredibly biased, racist, whatever, you know, kind of answer, because that's the kind of things that are on the internet, right? And um, as the tools get more and more powerful, it's going to become less and less likely that you can restrict it to data sets that are reliable. Uh, right now, uh, big companies like Bloomberg are training tools on their data sets. Uh, that'll be a lot better for, for certain. Uh, however, it, they're using so much data, it's impossible to police those data sets. So mm -hmm. any pricing data, no matter where you get it from, is going to have lots of spikes and problems with it. Any uh, textual data is going to have misdirection and lies in it. 
you know, even regulatory filings, which are um, beholden to the rule of law, people can go to jail for lying in them, there's still lies in them, right? And so uh, managing all that in the future, I think is just kind of a, a problem that we're going to become used to. Um, like an example I like to use is self-driving cars. Right. Uh, 30 years ago, if somebody drove a car into a tree or into the ocean, people will say, oh, that guy must have you know, been drunk. Right. There's no way a human being would do something like that, you know, rationally. But now if 100 dro- cars drive off a bridge into the ocean, say, oh, there must have been a bug in their program. You know, I, I completely understand how that happened, you know. So we're just going to have to get more used to and desensitized to catastrophic, unimaginable errors. Um, And people are going to deal with it because the power of the algorithms are going to be too uh, attractive to ignore. And also they they, they become very sensitive to the inputs as in the, you know, the inherent biases that, you know, for, you know, for male you know, um, uh, um, algorithm designers all went into the, going to the same school would come up with a completely different algorithm to, and the, the results will be completely different to somebody who was more diversified educationally and also culturally and come up and gender and come up with a completely different, uh, you know, probably with this very similar type algorithm, but of course, even the data set will be different that it was using to generate the the, the AI um, uh, set and the, the whole learning co- process. So yeah. the inherent biases that one puts into these processes is, is 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 normal. And you talked about you know normalizing data. Yeah, absolutely. And there are lots of interesting things that are happening now, and I'm not sure how they're going to pan out. So even you know back when they built the space shuttle, which was a long time ago, embarrassingly, uh, they used a, a bunch of computers and they voted on the answer, right? Because they knew computers were fallible. And so it was a, a majority vote. Um, nowadays, there are more sophisticated ways of ensuring uh, that sort of thing. But that also opens up problems that I think people are going to have trouble dealing with. And th- this is going to be pretty controversial, I think. But What if what we call biases are actually realities, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, what if a certain demographic is actually better at something than other demographics, right? They might have different genes or who knows, and the computers discover this thing and we force them to do things that aren't true. And that causes a, a sort of cognitive dissonance, you know, like Hal in 2001, right? And um so you know, that, that's entirely possible. Uh, you see a lot of controversy around ESG right now because what was very evident to some people is exactly the opposite to other people. They're anti-ESG people and they have rational arguments. And you know, just because people think that diversity or what have you uh, is, is really wonderful and they believe it's true, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the science isn't necessarily there. The narrative is there. I think everybody would love for it to be true, but what if it isn't, right? And um, there's a whole branch of really interesting AI, the the causal algorithms, right? The mm-hmm. causal inference algorithms that were popularized by Judea Pearl. And uh, I'm not a technical historian, but probably originated somewhere like with Bayes, uh, and have been used very successfully for spam filters and things and are growing in complexity and relevance and can, in my mind, absolutely surpass things like generative models because they seem so much more reliable and powerful. And um, you, you'll have to create these causal maps. And I think there will be a conflict between people's morals and intentions and causality and reality, uh, because I think there are a lot of beliefs people hold that may not hold up to scrutiny in such a rigorous way. Uh, But these causal methods are so attractive and compelling 
that once they get beyond their current limitations, these directed acyclic graphs that they're constrained to, mm -hmm. uh, I think that may be the next dominant method. Uh, I certainly hope so, because it, it sounds wonderful and it gets us away from this whole concept of tendency that's pervasive in statistics. It, one of the biggest problems with statistics is that it can only really measure tendency and tendency mm -hmm. causality. Exactly. So that's 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 time for another another um, podcast. We can talk about that as well and get in deep dive into that. That's such an interesting subject. And uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Michael. It's been a, you know it's been a sort of a bit of a historic journey in the the, the, the quant. It's been a personal journey for for both of us. It's been very interesting, and your book, which you know, in quant. Um, and finance is really, really, really a must read. And for anybody who really wants to actually understand what are the bases that one has to deploy in terms of just thinking about building quantitative models, because there's a lot of tools and that out there to do it, but you need to get the framework right, the data right, and all those sort of good housekeeping things that one has to do before you even start switching the engine on and trying to make money out of it. So thank you very much indeed for your time, Michael. If anybody wants to get hold of you, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, I have a website for the book, uh, quantitativeassetmanagement.com. And uh, it, you can email me from there. I, I recommend it. Uh, I'm very uh, diligently building out the website with code and videos and, and all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can get in touch with me there or you can matriculate at Columbia University and take my course and have face-to-face -face access. Fantastic. Michael Robbins, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I hope to speak to you soon. Thank you for viewing and engaging with today's podcast. If you're interested in knowing more about citiesabc.com with openbusinesscouncil.org, go to our platforms, as well as you can also find me on social media and direct message me, Hilton Super, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And do go to the other interviews we have done on YouTube. And don't forget to like and comment. So thank you very much for your time and engaging with this interview today on Cities ABC.